Good day, shalom. Welcome to another edition of Secrets of Meaning, the podcast and TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Adris. We thank you for joining us today. If you have ideas or comments about the programs or ideas for future podcasts, or if you'd like to become a sponsor for these podcasts, please feel free to email me, Rabbi Address at jewishsacredaging.com. Check out the website, Jewish Sacred Aging. And um, we want to welcome, um, in all honesty, an old friend uh, for a few years, few years, I've known Rabbi Sussman, Rabbi Lance Sussman, who is the uh, Rabbi Emeritus of Reform Congregation Knesset Israel in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, one of the leading scholars of American Jewish history uh, in the contemporary American rabbinate. And for our purposes today, we want to explore his brand new book um, with a very, very official picture. I really like the picture, Lance. It's a really cool picture. Uh, Portraits of an American Rabbi, subtitled In His Own Words. Um, available, I would imagine, Lance, through the uh, usual uh, suspects, uh, bookstores, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. You got it. And the dog agrees. Anyway, nice to see you, Lance. Good to see you. And congratulations on this book. Thank you. Um, there's tons of stuff on it. This is co- a collection of sermons, correct? And thoughts uh, or thoughts yes. and thoughts. Uh, sermons, uh, articles, essays reflecting my 21 years of KI. Knesset Israel called KI. A great synagogue. Uh, it's where I grew up. So um, there's so much to unpack on all these um, sermons and articles that really span decades, as you mentioned. But I want to start off with uh, something that, that, that you wrote um, a couple of times, and one specific, I think, um, either article or sermon on, uh, is the sermon dead? And the reason why I wanted to ask you about this is um, this has become a, a, a point of uh, an interesting conversation amongst many of my friends and I about the shift in, in our rabbinate. Uh, from where there were really formal sermons. And I remember sitting at Knesset Israel for years and years and years listening to Dr. Korn of Blessed Memory. Uh, these were formal, in many ways, academic sermons. Things seem to have changed, uh, in, uh, to make a generalization that a retreat from that formal Shabbat, every Shabbat sermon. Um, what's the story? What, What's your what's your take on this? Is the sermon dead? The sermon is dying. It's not dead. It's on life support. Wow. Um, I think different age groups, in particular within the community, have different interests. So uh, the older population, I think, still likes to hear a fuller message. The younger one, younger generations, uh, more entertainment. Um, the size of the sermon, meaning it's not the number of minutes, has been shrinking consistently for about a hundred years now. Um, I don't think it, it's going to completely die, but it's um, being replaced with a short comment to our Torah, Drash, that's heavy on entertainment and lighter on content. In some of our discussions and friends of ours, and, and, and no doubt somebody will say it's because of your age, but you alluded to the fact that w- w- the Friday night experience, uh, are we moving more towards performance Judaism than uh, um, a more meaningful Friday night experience? Is our job more to entertain people now, make them really feel good, but don't push it? I think from the congregant's point of view, the, the move is really away from performance. They want to participate. It used to be the Rabbi Canner team performed the service. And, and that has changed for many, many reasons. Uh, and today, congregants want to participate. I'm talking about the reform, conservative reconstruction as part of the, the liberal, the liberal stuff. In particular, because if you're in an orthodox model, then the, the individual Prayer is, is, is central. So it's by definition very 100% participatory. But even there, the sermon is, uh, is shrinking. So if for the congregants, it's shifting uh, to participation. Um, 
I would say for the for the clay kodesh for the rabbis, canners, and other readers, presenters, uh, it is moving away from performance in it, overall. There's always exceptions, and there is a little bit of a difference still between, let's say, the high holy day experience and um, a regular Shabbat. Uh, Simchat Torah, where there's probably no room for a sermon at all, although somebody might want to preach on Revelation and things like like that. Uh, and um, uh, overall, it is uh, diminishing. It's um, part of the the general culture there outside of the Jewish community. Um, if you look at TV evangelicals, uh, the sermon is still dominant and could go for almost an hour. Uh, so it, it really depends where you are in in society. It's, it's ironic in that the high level of education in the Jewish community, you would think that there would be more demand for intellectual content, but um, maybe those folks aren't coming to synagogue. We would have to analyze that. Yeah, and, and I think my experience is, and this may be a result of the pandemic, they, they, they may not be going to services, but they are going to classes. And um, that's what you find in the Orthodox community. They prefer the shiur to the sermon. So they want to have a lesson, let's say in Talmud. So hurry up with the sermon, which is a one way street. And let's move to reading text and having chavruta and, and study. So that's somewhat consistent. Yeah, I think we're finding that more and more and more. I think uh, as I teach around the country, there's just this real increase in. Uh, at least the constituency that we deal with in Jewish sacred aging, one serious adult study and they will commit the time to it because they never really had the opportunity to do it before. And there's probably all kinds of reasons for this. And, right. uh, and, and that's another book for you to write maybe. Um, but I'm sure you have, you're busy enough. The, there's a, um, a very interesting sermon in the book post Charlottesville. And, and when I was reading it, uh, I had just finished reading an, an article from a recent Atlantic magazine by Arthur David Brooks, not Arthur David Brooks on, um, where he talks about the moral compass and the lack of a moral compass. And then, and then in reading that sermon on Charlottesville, it just stuck with me. And I really would like to have you unpack this, uh, a little bit. Because this, the, the Charlottesville sermon is really, really very, very beautiful and powerful. Thank you. What What's your take upon the shift in our society and the lack of a moral compass? And is it a call for a reevaluation or a redefinition of Jewish education, even from the beginnings, like in religious school, of, of, of teaching more of a, the way to function in society from a Jewish value perspective? as opposed to just teaching to prepare somebody for a bar mitzvah? Well, Charlottesville represents uh, a marker um, in the history of anti-Semitism in America, closely followed by the terrible tragedy in, in Pittsburgh, in which physical violence against the Jewish community has uh, found a new level of expression in the United States, uh, Pittsburgh being the, the most violent episode in American history. Uh, and it is, is, there is concern. There's no question. Um, it's still coming from marginal groups empowered by social media, but there is a failure of condemnation, um, of these activities of spreading the, um, political umbrella wide enough to include some of these elements instead of marginalizing them. Uh, one of the things I encounter uh, constantly is, and this is um, part part of the, the tension of being a pulpit rabbi, uh, is to try to please your different constituencies. Some want to hear you lash out against the right. And others want to hear what you have to say about threats from the left. So you spend your time doing a balancing act instead of um, concentrating on what you think is a more precise analysis. So it's even even that work of 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 interpreting the moment 
congregation has been affected by the um, the, the 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 pressing polarization that has developed in in American society. It's been aggravated. Um, yeah, we have to remember that the United States had a, a civil war, and the battles are over, but that war is not over, and it takes many different forms. Whether it's a an abuse of states' rights or or racism or or whatever you want to call it, and we we are a we are a terribly divided country at this point that um, not only don't agree on values, but don't agree on facts. And it is extremely difficult. It is extremely difficult. Um, the the reform movement, the Jewish community is is not immune from that. No, there's no community. Th- this is why I wanted to raise this issue because it jumped out at me when I read this Charlottesville sermon about the retreat from some sense of moral center. Um, and it's a, ch- it, it is a, a real, t- and I know, and you know, uh, congregational rabbis who really, especially look, we've just come out of the holidays, but, but really pulled in a variety of different directions. And in, some of them were actually, you know, I'm not giving away any secrets, very concerned how honest or forthright to be from the pulpit on the holidays for fear of backlash within their own membership. And that's, that's, and when we grew up in the sixties, I remember Rabbi Kyman of blessed memory, who was the assistant rabbi at, at KI when I was growing up preaching and, you know, the Vietnam stuff and people disagreed with it. But there was a, there was a greater acceptance of that's the role of the rabbi to, 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 uh, raise moral issues as opposed to, like you're saying now, people just being pulled in a variety of different directions. That's why I wanted to raise that moral compass to, question. Me, the question is to what extent is the contemporary rabbi an heir, H-E-I-R, oh, right. of the ancient prophets of Israel who spoke truth to power, who afflicted the comfortable and comforted the afflicted and called it like it is. Uh, I remember being introduced to prophetic literature as a camper in a CIT program, Camp Harlem in the Poconos. Uh, I, we I remember it very well. I remember it very Rabbi, well. We, we were both there in very different capacities. Uh, Rabbi Howie Bogot picked the book of Amos Amos. Right, right. And uh, um, it was a turning point in my life. Here's a person who spoke up, uh, essentially uh, invaded a, uh, a sisterhood meeting in ancient Israel and, and talked about the fat cows of Bashan. Well, if you'd like to pack your library up and see your contract torn, you can talk like a mouse, <laughs> or you can find a different, uh, a different way of getting the message across. So there, there is this heritage particularly in reform and also in conservative and reconstruction, is that the pulpit is still a prophetic platform, but then you have to balance it against the realities of of your immediate community. To what extent do you want to irritate them? To what extent do you uh, want to play it safe? Because your officers or others are saying, look, people will quit, uh, people will withhold funding. Uh, there's a number of means, and, and there are direct attacks on rabbis who take a position, and you have to decide, is it worth it? Uh, unless you happen to be in that rare community where there's 90% agreement. Uh, and I have never never worked at, since 1980 or even before as a student in, in a community where there was enough consensus where that was safe. I had to make decisions about what I would bring up. You, one of the, again, very, very powerful, I think, uh, sermons collected in your book stems from, um, a Yom Kippur, uh, uh, several years ago. I think it was 19, um, 2018. And this aspect of forgiveness. And look, we've just come out of the high holidays and most of our colleagues in one way, shape or form or another, spoke about, alluded to, preached about this concept of forgiveness. And you raise in this sermon, you know, there there may be times when you just can't forgive. And you're the last line, the last part of this sermon, which I underline 
You say, whenever we cannot forgive, let us strive for self-respect, fairness, and proportionality. Could you unpack that line? Because it's a really beautiful, beautiful coda. Well, first, thank you for reading it so closely. Well, um, there's so many places to go with this. The first thought that comes to my mind is maximum forgiveness. I, I went to college in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Amish country, and many years back, there was a a horrible shooting in an Amish school. A gunman went in, killed some children, Amish Amish children, and um, that community instantly forgave the shooter and brought freshly baked apple pies to the home of what became his, his widow, I, I, I think. And um, it was hard for me to digest that level of commitment to the doctrine of, of um, forgiveness. Um, when the other side, there are uh, unrestrained calls for revenge beyond justice, which was a huge question at the end of World War II and the Holocaust. And Stalin said, just gather up the 150,000 most important Nazis and shoot them and, and be done with them. And the, and the Americans and the Allies said, no, we have to have a, a process of, of law and not just take revenge. So you have these goalposts of total forgiveness and no forgiveness whatsoever. I, I, on Yom Kippur, we're assured that, depending on your your actual personal concept of God, that there's a forgiving God, although that's challenging too. We're asked to forgive others, uh, to be godly, um, but we're not commanded to totally forgive. And there are those situations in our own private lives. I've experienced it. My family, my children have experienced where there has been wrong committed against us, so deep so painful, so hurtful, that you can't forgive. But then how do you move forward as a person and and not be filled with the desire to to find revenge as as the goal of your life? Then you yourself are no longer living. You're you're captured, you're a captor, a, a prisoner uh to these feelings of of revenge. Uh and it it is a difficult challenge for all of us to work with those incidents in our lives that harmed us beyond our capacity to to forgive if we're if we're not Amish you know, how do we handle it and it's painful and it's real which is a very and that and thank you for sharing that because it's an interesting segue into really another one of your high holiday sermons that that is that is in the book about uh, the issue of personal strength, which of course is a theme that many of our colleagues preached on. I'm sure during the high holidays, and this idea of where where one where one goes to gather one's personal strength in the midst of challenges. Um, we've known each other for a few years. You are not immune to some challenges personal challenges, which you allude to, health challenges. Rabbi Sussman, where do you go for your own personal strength? Well, Rabbi Kushner, of course, wrote a book, which was a, a midrash when I, I lift my eyes to the mountains from, from whence my strength comes. And that book was immensely helpful to literally um, millions of people because he, he redirected the question to when these things happen to us and away from why do these things happen to us. So where do we go when these things? So I did have some health challenges a few years ago, and that led to what I considered to be a premature um, retirement. And I was looking down the barrel of a gun. There's no question about it. And I was very scared. And the first level of um, of help of existential help that, that came to me uh, was um, from my family and uh, from the hospital staff. Really? Uh, particularly the nursing staff. 
two, three in the morning. I was a mess. I was in trouble. Uh, they had un, unrestrained, unfiltered kindness. Um, I actually wrote a book of poems called uh, The Kindness Response as a way of thanking my family and the staff who took care of me in, in my moment of peril. Um, they were so loving, so so strong that it, it began to fill me back up with the strength that had been drained out of me by by surgery, by complications and other things. And slowly, slowly, uh, I came to it. In other circumstances, uh, perhaps it's music, um, beloved music, music that has always spoken to me um, in an emotional way that lifts me up. In other, at, at other times, uh, there are written passages, sometimes the prayers, sometimes a sonnet. It can, co- it can come from anywhere. Um, and there are memories. There, there are memories. Um, we like to go to the shore, and uh, sometimes the, the sound of the waves and nature are kind of a transcendental experience also provides just enough strength, just a a teeny tiny dosage to turn the tide from from fear or anger or whatever it is that's bringing you down and letting you rise back up to whatever level you can go to. There there are multiple multiple sources. Uh, I did have an incident in my life where um, I was told, and this was a spiritual turning moment, for me, uh, one of my kids became very, very sick one summer as a teenager and um, uh, lost 40 pounds over the course of a summer, a teenager. Uh, he, he had, um, he, he had a test done and the surgeon uh, came back to us. They had removed some things from him. And the doctor said, um, Make arrangements. And I said, I don't even understand what you're talking about. What does that mean, make arrangements? He says, we don't think there's much we can do um, to help your kid. And I, I remember slamming the hospital wall, punch, really punching it hard and saying, God, don't do this to me. I, I spent a whole lifetime struggling as to whether or not I believed in God or what kind of God I believed in and whether God had any power or not. And, and there I was, maybe the, even worse than my own illness. Um, and that's what I said. Um, I don't believe it was just cultural language. I think it was real. And it made me, it made me more comfortable looking for a transcendent a transcendent source of healing. But it took a long time, and I don't want to overplay the word suffering, but it took some personal suffering to, to get there. Well, thank you, Lance. Um, to shift gears a little bit, you have this wonderful, um, I think it's an article uh, contained within the book uh, about Alaska. Yeah. Okay. And, and the slattery report. Yeah. I, I will, I'm going to bet my suits probably to be useless Phillies tickets that the majority of our people just may not know what the slattery report has to do with Alaska. Could you just, this is a great, great article. Um, could you just enlighten us a little bit? What's the slattery report? Well, the way I got to that was kind of interesting. Um, we have a museum at Knesset, Israel, uh, wonderful exhibitions. Uh, one of which years ago was, uh, local photographers. One of the photographers just spoke to me. Uh, so I called and we had lunch and I found out that years ago he had been a fundraiser for UJA in the West Coast early, early in the history of that organization. And Alaska was on his beat. And I, and I started to learn things about Alaska. What, and this was uh, just before World War II. Uh, 
Alaska was not a state. It was a territory, and therefore it was not subject uh, to the immigration laws of, of the United States from 1921-24, which restricted the number of immigrants, particularly from East Europe and South Europe, meaning Jewish, Jewish people in particular. Uh, uh, there were people in different port cities on the Alaskan coast that were looking to improve the economy of their, their towns. Uh, and they came up with this idea that Alaska could be a refuge, uh, for, um, Jews in Germany uh, and others under the threat of, of Hitler at that time. Ultimately, it failed, but there was this idea that, um, Alaska could become kind of a Jewish refuge. Interestingly, um, the idea didn't play well in the American Jewish community. Um, they felt that it would increase anti-Semitism and therefore should not, should not be pushed. Uh, and, you know, linking that to your question or my question about what happens when you can't forgive, um, I don't think the American Jewish community is sufficiently explored its role. It's very easy to knock FDR and his politics, but what did we do? What did, what did the reform movement do? I could easily make myself persona non grata in the reform movement more than I am <laughs> uh, by writing a book about the failure of reform Judaism in, in rescue. Yeah, there were, some, there was some rescue, but most of it actually was, was private. The rabbinate didn't do too well either. And, and this was just one of many uh, attempts to, uh, failed attempts to create uh, rescue uh, that didn't happen. The, uh, I know you're, you're one of the preeminent scholars of American Jewish history, uh, in in our field and i know uh, you we've had some conversations and i hope we'll have more um dealing with the civil war uh pre-civil war in civil war the mishigas and conflicts within the american jewish community then juxtapose that to world war ii so i hope you do write that book because i i i, I think it's a book that needs to be written to tell you the truth um right. because we we operate in this sort of like massaged History is massaged uh, right. uh, in, in a variety of different ways. Speaking of history, uh, again, we're talking to Rabbi Lance Sussman, the Emeritus Rabbi from Congregation Kness of Israel here in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, uh, and his book, Portrait of an American Rabbi, uh, in his own words. And before we start running out of time, I, I would be remiss because you have a significant number of mentioned sermons, articles that deal with Israel. Um, Talk to me about, you know, this, what's going on. Now we're, we're recording this right before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, right. the protests are still going on. There's still going to be readings of the, of, of more bills. You write extensively in articles and sermons in the book. What's your take, Rabbi Sussman, on what's going on there now? So in terms of the, the book, they reflect my activity from 2001 to 2022, which is just before the current um, Netanyahu government in, in Israel. So I don't speak to the current situation on judicial overhaul uh, in the book itself. But in the two decades plus, when it was my job as, as rabbi preacher to try and interpret the moment uh, to my people, there were all types of incidents, problems with with Israel, in which um, terrorists acted murder in murderous fashion against Israel, there were policies and actions by the Israeli government um, which um, were unacceptable um, to me. And again, a rabbi has to make a choice. We all have to make choices about which views to light and what to leave alone. Um, in in going through my work, uh, I what. One of the things that surprised me was how protective I was of Israel. Despite any of its sins, uh, at the end of the day, my message was speak up for what you believe is true, stand for justice, stand for mercy, stand for inclusion, but don't walk away from it. Uh, Jewish homeland, the largest Jewish population center in the world, 
we have a very rough history as a people, despite the fact that we are so privileged here in the United States. And many of our neighbors can't believe we were ever persecuted because we're so privileged. How can you have ever had any problems? Um, that there is a need for an Israel and that, uh, we, we need Israel and Israel needs us. Um, there needs to be that. Uh, bilateral relationship that Ahataam and others wrote about early in the history of the Zionist movement. There needs to be this interplay between the diaspora community, particularly our community that's grounded in um, democratic values to keep the state of Israel both Jewish and, and democratic. So as hard as it is today, and I hear this constantly, I mean, I'm no longer the in- interpreter, the enfranchised interpreter in the pulpit. Um, that they've had it, they're done, they're not going there, they're not supporting it. Um, and I have to say, look, uh, are you packing and leaving the United States because we have problems? You know, you, you, you could go to uh, uh, Portugal or you could, you could go to Costa Rica or you could go to some other place uh, because we have so many problems or where do you dig in? What, what, what do you do? So I, I think Israel is part of the family. And uh, I urge not to have a divorce. And we need family therapy. There's no question about it. It's the truth. So from Binghamton, New York, to Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, and the book and your writings and your teaching, your PhD, and looking backward and looking forward, Lance, what's the greatest blessing that you've achieved? And what's the greatest challenge? that you see? I've had an abundance of blessings. Um, I begin with my family, um, beginning with my uh, grandmothers. And then I look across the generations because I'm the old guy at the table now in my family um, to my grandchildren. And, um, you know, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Well, that's the, that is the first place that comes from. Um, I have had the, the blessing of uh, pursuing scholarship that I always wanted since I learned to read, since my dad taught me how to read one on one. He was my tutor to teach me to read. And, um, I've been able to live a life of engagement with, um, books and ideas. Um, and I'm not done with that. I retired from the pulpit, but I didn't retire from being a rabbi and I didn't retire from my scholarship. In fact, my family is telling me I'm too eager right now to, to make up for what I consider lost time. And, and the third is, um, my pastoral experience. Um, I remember one point in, in Binghamton, I I was a, full-time professor, and I had a synagogue that grew to about 300 families. Binghamton's a fairly isolated community in the mountains. It's in a, mostly in a valley and hill, hill slopes. I remember driving into the synagogue one day and, and looking at the landscape, and I said to myself, you know, every week I experience almost all of life in this little place, from new babies to the death of old people to, to tragedies to families on the rocks and all, all, all within a single week just comes at me because of what I decided uh, to do. And I hope that in that role, um, as a support system, as a counselor, as a voice of tradition, voice of reason, uh, I've impacted people and, and in their time of need. So yes, where's the strength come from? So if, for me, having been put in a position to pro- help provide strength to other people is immensely satisfying. It's immensely satisfying that I've had that opportunity. It's the gift of the rabbinate. Um, I, no, I don't think I know. It is the gift of the rabbinate. No question. To be able to touch people in so many different ways. And have and plant seeds because that's what really we do a lot of times. And right, um, Rabbi Lance Sussman, you, you give great honor and cover to your parents and to that wonderful synagogue on Park Heights Avenue in Baltimore. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, have oh, 
Oh, Eb Shalom. The former where, Oh, Eb Shalom now merged. Yes, yes, but I remember it from Oh, Eb Shalom. Right. So thank you very much, and good luck with this book. Available, Portrait of an American Rabbi, available, and where you usually get your books, uh, either electronically or in actually brick and mortar. Uh, Lance, continued success. A uh, healthy, healthy, healthy year for you and your family. Uh, and I'll see you uh, hopefully uh, soon, either on Old York Road or some other place around there. So take care and thank you very much. I certainly hope so. And I thank you for this opportunity. I'm not believing our honor. To all of you, thank you very much for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of uh, Jewish Sacred Aging. And again, you can contact me with ideas or suggestions, rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. And if you go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and you'd like to help support the work of uh, Jewish Sacred Aging and these podcasts, you'll find a conveniently located donate button. And uh, just click on it and follow the prompts, and we're very, very appreciative of that. Uh, as likewise, if you would like to become a sponsor for some of these podcasts. We appreciate your time and a reminder that Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies in gorgeous, bucolic, quiet, and peaceful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out to our genius producer, Steve Lubetkin. Again, I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. I look forward to greeting you again on our next Seekers of Meaning. In the meantime, stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Have a great year. And most of all, be kind to one another. Shalom, Todah.